coins. When the surgical strike, for example, decapitated the regime as sort of the main first attack mm -hmm. that is this kind of drug, could be achieved also if you at the same time doing surgical uh, um, attacks, bombing against some nuclear sites. It's difficult. It's not like the Iraqi regime where only about seven or eight people, you can get them together and decapitate them, the regime and the regime's falls. No, it, 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 so it's a difficult one, and that's what makes actually this kind of action, <coughs> whether it's legitimate or not, depending on what kind of resolution you, you get, it's difficult. Uh, Iranian President Nagar justified his foreign policy by saying his strategy has been successful so far because it's largely. And, and one main weakness in military action that President Obama will never sanction it. And President Obama, unfortunately, actually is seen by certain uh, uh, radical forces around the world as weak president, is very good at rhetoric, but does nothing. So far, he hasn't actually done anything or practical or anything he actually promised internally or externally. And my main worry again that the, 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 the radical elements, Ahmadinejad, might see that as weakness and exploit that to harden their position. I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that uh, Society Outreach has done this time is that they've got so many experts. Uh, talking about this issue that I'm a little confused when I'm into because there are specialist journalists and specialists on Iran, Islam and this region and our next uh, specialist is uh, Kasra Nadi who is a journalist, he's author and a special correspondent for BBC Persian TV so the floor is yours sir Thank you very much um, I thought um, since everyone is uh, so far speaking about the big picture vis-a-vis -vis Iran and its nuclear program to inject a bit of uh, detail in terms of internal dynamics these days. Uh, my contention is that uh, since the elections, the disputed elections in June, the picture has changed. Iran is a different country and we have to recognize that. And I think that has a good impact, important impact, on, um, on the whole uh, nuclear debate and what Iran does and its behavior vis-a-vis -vis the international community. Case in point is, is this latest development. Uh, just before uh, I came to this meeting, I was checking the news. Uh, the latest is that Iran is saying that they will respond to the latest uh, draft agreement uh, that uh, Mr. Al-Baradeh, the chief of the IAEA, has, has, has drawn out. They're going to respond to it uh, tomorrow. Um, um, this is an agreement or a draft agreement that already Russia, uh, France and the United States have agreed to. Iran has taken it back to Tehran for further um, uh, uh, consultation and discussion. Uh, and tomorrow we might get a response from Iran. The issue is that whether Iran should send uh, almost uh, two-thirds of its enriched uranium uh, to abroad, to Russia, and instead of that, get uh, a nuclear fuel for its research reactor in Tehran. Um, apparently, the deal, uh, the understanding with the Iranians is that they will send uh, about 1,200 kilos of its enriched, low enriched uranium to Russia for further um, 1,200 kilo out of 1,700 kilo, kilos of enriched uranium. And instead of it, uh, they will get uh, the fuel they want uh, for the nuclear research uh, reactor in Tehran. The issue has uh, led to a good deal of debate in Tehran whether this is advisable or not, whether Iran should go down that line or not. Um, I note that the hardliners in Tehran who are in power are divided on this. Um, I saw a statement by the Speaker of Parliament uh, which came out against this, uh, saying that uh, the West wants to cheat Iran and there's no need for Iran to send this um, a nuclear enriched uranium, enriched uranium abroad uh, for this fuel. 
So, and the debate, uh, I understand, and my uh, contention is, is, is very much connected to the situation of Iran today, the internal politics. The fact is that um, uh, good, um, uh, the debate is, is about whether this is um, advisable for Iran to go down this, uh, uh, this road at this particular junction, uh, which is, uh, will be seen as a climb down for uh, the regime vis-a-vis -vis the international community, and this is dangerous given the fact uh, that a good deal of people in Iran are opposed uh, to this government and, and the position of the government is not as strong as it used to be. Um, this also leads to the fact that um, the whole nuclear issue uh, which was a pretty popular, I must say, um, until a year ago, until six months ago, is not as popular uh, in Iran as it was. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, basically, uh, what is happening today in Iran is because there is a good deal of opposition, whatever the government does, a good deal of people want to take the opposite uh, view and the opposite uh, attitude to it. I don't have any empirical uh, data to, to present here or any strong quotation from any of the leaders in Iran to back this, uh, but my own uh, reading between the line and seeing what is going on in Iran, the nature of debate, uh, my understanding is that um, uh, they have to think hard um, before deciding on this. It will definitely be seen as a climb down and that will be dangerous for the regime and its, its um, stability, given the fact that it's a good deal of people are against it today. Uh, but that doesn't mean that tomorrow um, Iranians are going to agree to this. My, my own impression is that they probably will agree but uh, attach a number of conditions to it that at the end will become somewhat unacceptable to the, uh, to the other countries present in the meeting. Uh, the fact is that there are hardliners in Iran who uh, want Iran to go down the line of a nuclear uh, device at least, if not a nuclear weapon. Uh, those are the people in Keihan newspaper, for example, the hardliners, who see this as, as, as a way of, of um, uh, ridding themselves of the sort of threats they have been uh, facing from Israel and from the United States over the years, the threats of, 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 of uh, military action against Iran. And uh, these hardliners uh, in Tehran believe that a test of a nuclear device of some kind uh, will give the Iran uh, the position it wants to, it will uh, prove uh, to the neighbors and the outside world they see it as, as being a member of the nuclear club and that will, uh, that will um, strengthen Iran's position in, uh, strategically vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis its neighbors and also with Israel and the United States. So uh, there is that uh, push uh, from the hardliners in Iran. But as I said, I'm going to stop there. We will uh, wait and see what the response is and where, where we go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now our next speaker is uh, another uh, very good friend of mine, Rita Payne. Uh, she used to be the head of uh, Asia Today, uh, BBC World. Uh, just not very far from here, and uh, for many years uh, she was very kind to me. She, uh, occasionally she'd get me on the BBC World, <laughs> so I want to say thank you to her here. But she's not here as uh, BBC World in Asia today. She, uh, she's uh, elected chair of Commonwealth Journalists Association UK, and the floor is yours, Rita. Thank you. Um, well, at the very outset, I want to make it clear that I'm not here <coughs> as a specialist. <coughs> Um, I'm here really uh, as a journalist, as an observer, an interested observer. I'm also offering a bit of a double act because, as Lord Ahmed said, until last year um, I was Asia editor of BBC World TV News and I spent nearly 30 years with BBC, so I really have absorbed the whole BBC ethos of neutrality and balance. So that includes all our colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and Humphrey uh, Hawksley, um, who 
worked very closely and supported our program. He is a, um, a current BBC World Affairs correspondent.